Well, thank you so much, first of all, for joining us this Sunday. My name is Rochelle Eid. For those who are joining us for the first time today, I am your host. I am the cash flow nurse, and I do this every Sunday because I would like to help you and 100,000 nurses and healthcare professionals uh, get financial freedom through real estate investing. And we will be talking a lot about that today with our guest, Ms. Bessie Kapulian from LA. Um, we're going to talk about why passive investing is the way to go and how do we underwrite in this type of market and how do we vet sponsors. So very important aspects. So part of this, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow suit here. Uh, I'm going to follow Trevor's steps and give some disclaimer that we are not financial advisors and we are not CPAs. So all the information you're going to get here today are for educational and informational purposes. And as an investor, you, we should be vetting or we should be double checking the information that we get anyway, right? That is part of our due diligence. So... So without further ado, we're going to get started because we have a lot to talk about. And, you know, we, we always have fun in this tab, in this webinars. So feel free to chime in if you have some questions. Um, Vessi's background is in commercial lending. So I have a lot of questions for her but pertaining to that. But anything, she's an experienced syndicator. She, she belongs to the Warrior Group, where, which I belong to as well with Rod Cliff's Warrior Group. And she has closed on six properties. So she's, she's done a few things. So I think, she, you know, she's an authority on the subject. So welcome, Bessie. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day and giving value back to the community. Thank you so much for saying yes to my invite. Thank you so much for having me, Rochelle. I'm really, really excited to be here and really looking forward to our conversation today and hopefully adding uh, several golden nuggets and adding value to the audience along the way. I am super excited. First of all, you were one of those, um, the warriors that I looked up to. You didn't, you don't know this. And I, you know, I, it's my fault. I didn't reach out to you early on, but, but I remember as a new warrior last year, I saw your photo when you got the warrior sword. And for those who don't know, this is the, this is kind of like the, the reward that we get when you close on your prop on a property. Rod Cleef will send us a sword and we get to show it off on Facebook. And I saw Bessie got one of that and I was like, wow, how did she do that? So walk us through your journey. So you have 15 years in commercial lending mm -hmm. and now you're, you're in real estate. So how did you get, get into real estate, first of all, um, mm -hmm. and why? So it looks like, you know, you've done commercial lending and mm -hmm. then you decided to, to jump and go, get into the real estate um, side of things. Absolutely. Yes, very, very happy to share. In fact, as I introspectively look back through through my life and career, I, I often like to say that that real estate seed was planted in me uh, many, many years ago behind the Iron Curtain. So I, I grew up in Bulgaria. And at the time, um, a lot of people, right, when they talked about investments, talked about investing in hard assets, specifically real estate, commodities, like gold, silver, basically in the form of jewelry. There wasn't really a developed stock market at the time. Um, so that concept or seed was there for a while, except that it didn't germinate for a few years. It was my dream to come to the U.S. and, and study, and the only way for me to do that is to um, effectively earn a full-time scholarship, which is what I did and, and how I landed here. And with that said, I followed the traditional path of going to school, um, getting a corporate job and really starting to climb that corporate ladder, which is what success was painted to me as. And, and I felt that's what success looked like. Uh, but I'm really glad that I picked up different clues along the way a few events that probably a lot of people would recall, like the Enron scandal, then the 0809 crisis, which is when I started my lending career, and then going through a couple of restructures within my own employer, and I was spared. But um, that left me thinking, wow, what if I'm next? And that could happen to anyone. Um, I can't control corporate restructures. I can't control what the market will do and potentially leaving me without a 
uh, 401k because the stock market collapsed. I can't control that, but what can I control? And I think that's when that seed really started germinating. So I resorted back to what I knew, which was real estate. And at the time that really started with an idea of building a small retirement nest egg um, to diversify from the stock market. So I decided to buy my first single family home. Uh, living in Los Angeles, um, there were a few challenges I encountered. One was the, the price point, which required a pretty substantial amount of liquidity. And, and secondly was the uh, tenant friendly loss, which I, I, again, I was trying to minimize the uncertainty within the business. So that pushed me to look out of state. I'm so glad that I made that decision. It was terrifying at the time, but um, as all great things uh, happen, uh, usually that's on the other side of comfort. So I made that first step, um, did my diligence, of course, but took what I like to call calculated risk. And um, shortly after, as that investment worked out, I decided to expand my portfolio, um, bought a couple more single family homes and duplexes, basically residential properties. And that's when the light bulb went on. Wow, this is not just a small retirement nest egg. This could be something bigger, potentially an income stream that can replace my W-2 job or, or at a minimum provide additional security versus relying on a single source of income. At that time, I, I, I took a deep dive and uh, really decided to transition into multifamily. Why? Because I could leverage a lot of my professional experience and background as a commercial lender, as well as my experience asset managing my residential portfolio. And, and yes, residential is different from multifamily, but there are a lot of transferable um, skills and, and knowledge that you can apply from one to the other. Um, so took a deep dive, uh, found a, a mastermind or, or, or mentoring program because a lot of successful people I spoke with at the time all pointed uh, to the fact that what helped them accelerate their own journey was getting a mentor and a coach along the way. And um, ultimately, I, I selected the Warrior program, rolled up my sleeves, got to work and uh, and officially made that transition about a year or so ago and now looking to continue to grow and uh, help others along the way. What an amazing story. Thank you so much for breaking that down uh, for us. So you, you came from Bulgaria, you're an immigrant just like myself, um, and you said that you had, in, um, you, you had known about real estate while you were still in Bulgaria, is this right? That's correct, yes. Um, that was really, when people discussed investments, that's really what they talked about. And, and not necessarily cash flowing property. It was just even it, for some people that was ability to buy their own home, which was not quite common at the time, or potentially buy a second home, vacation home, and then pass it on from generation to generation. So basically hard assets that would effectively grow in value over time. I would like to point that out because um, I'm actually in the process of, of trying to liquidate our land back home in the Philippines. But mm -hmm. I, as a, as a young child, I remember, and I feel like real estate is such a universal, uh, how do I say this, like um, a, a universal indicator of wealth, right? So mm -hmm. even in the Philippines, even as a young child, I don't know anything. I'm going to school, you know, minding my own business. And, but then I knew even then that those who, who own land, those who own properties were wealthy. I don't know how I knew that. I don't know, maybe I saw it on TV, but somehow as a, you know, like as somebody very immature, you know, I knew that for a fact and there is something to that. And it's not only your story. I've heard this from other people as well, even in, even in their home countries, you know, like real estate has been, um, in fact, Dr. Holt, uh, who was one of our guests, had invested in real estate in her home in her in her uh, home country of mm -hmm. Nigeria and it's the same in, you know it's the same thing it's because she wanted to build wealth and she did it through real estate so it's not here only here in the U.S. I mean the U.S. is still the land of opportunity I think it's still easier here to acquire properties like if you want to go into real estate you want to acquire single family or multifamily it's still easier here relatively here in the U.S compared to other places. So I feel blessed in that way. 
and I'm sure I'm sure you feel the same way and and the other um, immigrants who have come here because I've done a lot of interviews and I've, um, a few of them are are immigrants and who are doing fantastic in real estate. So I say that because I think like you said, you know, if you roll up your sleeves, there's there's no way for you to fail. Um, I think once we put in the hard work, you put in your homework, you do your homework, you do your due diligence, there is no way for you not to succeed. And I, I love, I always love that story because there's, there, there is truth to that. So let's talk about the stock market. So you had mentioned something about you, it is something that you cannot control. And so you looked elsewhere um, on how to build wealth. Talk to us what made you realize that? Like, did something happen? Mm -hmm. um, was it the stock market stum stumbling in 2008 or, or early 2000s that made you realize this? Absolutely. And it was the global events, right? Like with the Enron scandal, when people had most of their stocks, right? With, with the company um, stock ownership line, when the stock collapsed, they were left with pretty much nothing. And unfortunately for, for some of them at retirement, um, a similar event happened during the global financial crisis, right? During 08, 09, when the market collapsed. And I guess if, if uh, you are just starting your career, yes, maybe you have uh, 20, 30, 40 years ahead of you to, to make that up. But I imagine myself, what if I'm 60 or 65 or 70, right? And, and, and looking to retire and all of a sudden, all these savings evaporated just like that. And I may have to exactly. <laughs> work for longer or, or think of other means to support my, my life. Um, also, the whole idea of just counting my money until I die just sounds really depressing. Why, why, sh why, would it, why shouldn't it be limitless, right? Why shouldn't I look to grow and leave something behind, whether it's for loved ones or, or charities or, or other people? Why, why should I make my money last for a certain number of days after I retire? Um, so between those events and the, the whole idea of, gosh, I have this limited box within which I must uh, adhere to and live, um, it sounded that that was scary. And I think you could say from that standpoint, it was the fear that pushed me. And I didn't want to look back 20, 30 years from now and figure out, wow, well, I should have started sooner. Now, I, if you ask me today, yes, I wish I had started sooner, but I also don't want to look back 20 years from now and feel that same level of regret. So at that time, it was clear I need to take action and, and, and focus on what I can control, right? Because there are a lot of factors you cannot control, and that's just... Uh, part of life and, and, and how markets work, but uh, focus on the things that you can control to mitigate and manage that risk. I absolutely agree. Um, if, you know, for those who have attended the webinar, I always say um, the, the stock market is actually risky, especially if you don't understand how it works. And when you're putting all, if you're, you're betting all of your money into the stock market. And it, like you said, it's not something that you can control. So um, a lot of that, when I read the book, Money Master the Game by Tony Robbins, and in the book, it actually says, written there, if you guys haven't seen it, I think it's the first few pages, that the stock market is actually rigged against the, the normal investor, the average person. It's it's like by the time that you put your investment in the stock market, it has already been milked by Wall Street. They've already made the money out of it. And that is one, I mean, the, the, the whole book actually talks about how to put, how to invest your money in, in I think index funds is, is what they're saying that is the safest way to do it. Um, but the whole premise of the book is that if you don't know how to manage, if you don't know the rules to the game, that's why it says master um, money, master the game. If you don't know the rules to the game, you're going to lose. And so, and you cannot time the market. You cannot even rely on financial advisors because um, financial advisors are not legally um, binded to look after your interest. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, financial fiduciaries are different. Fiduciaries are different. Um, so if you want to go that route, he advises to, to go find a fiduciary to help you kind of uh, manage your finances. But having said that, once I've read that book, 
and then I also read Rich Dad, Poor Dad and kind of like that combination that kind of just did it for me. It was a light bulb moment. I said, okay, I need to become an investor. Not, not even a self-employee, like not, a, not even like a business owner. I have to be an investor in order to get mm-hmm. ahead. Absolutely. And so, yeah, and this is why I do these webinars. Um, like I've said in the, at the beginning, my mission is to help nurses understand that they have to take control of their finances. They have to find investment assets where they have, they understand first and foremost that they understand how it works, how do they make money, and that it is a tangible asset. So, um, and this is what, this is why I'm doing all these webinars in order for, for to educate um, nurses and other individuals about the beauty of real estate. And clearly you understood that, Vessi, and, you, and you're one of the lucky ones who's like, all right, I'm gonna do this. <laughs> <laughs> I look like the math, the numbers work. Um, let me see where I can take this. So, so you, you said you found the mentorship. And so how did you find your first deal? Walk us through that. Yeah, so it was, it was a lot of work and a lot of persistence. I'm not going to lie. But there are two things that I did first when I started the program. And, and that was the decision to focus one was to focus on a skill set that I can that I can utilize to not only find deals but also add value to others. And the second one is to select a market. In in my case, given my um, commercial lending background, I decided to focus on acquisition and deal sourcing. And specifically for market, I selected Florida. Why? Because I already had some residential properties there. So I had some familiarity with the market connections, boots on the ground, etc. And from there on, it was really getting to work. At that time, the market was really competitive. And, and, and I'm sure we'll talk about the market today as well. But what year were- was that when you first got your property? Pardon? What, what year did you get your property in Florida? Um, so I I we closed well I, we got on on under LOI in June no sorry March of 2022 and we closed in June of 2022 and um at, at that time right there were a lot of deals but there was also a lot of competition for deals and so and by the time I found that first deal I had underwritten nearly 200 deals. So talk about per- persistent and, and not uh, not getting discouraged along the way. Of those 200, uh, we had submitted five letters of intent or LOIs. And of those five, only one was accepted. Mm-hmm. And, and throughout that time, I was also focused on building relationships uh, with brokers, potential partners so that I could effectively develop the infrastructure that I needed in order to close. Um, Coincidentally, around that time, there was also an opportunity to participate in a syndication. So I had been helping a number of warriors with underwriting and one brought a deal to me and, and the numbers worked. Everything checked out except the market and that particular deal was in Georgia. So I wasn't focused on Georgia, but the, the team, was a strong one the deal was a strong one the market was a strong one so I decided to to dive in so it wasn't planned that way but it ended up with two deals that basically one came shortly after the other that closed within about two weeks apart oh wow that that is definitely something especially back in 2022 the market's so hot everybody's trying to buy and sellers are just you know like trying to get what as much as I can so that must have been an experience. Absolutely. It's, and again, I think ultimately what it boils down to is having a clear goal, um, set, going after that goal by doing the work because it's not going to happen without doing the work and, um, and knowing your why, because there are a lot of moments, high moments that are all great, but there are also a lot of down moments, moments of self-doubt. Will, will I succeed? Will I make this true? Gosh, this is deal 100. And, and I've gone through a hundred no's. What am I doing? When, when will this first deal come along? But I think it's when you know your why, um, that will pull you up during um, tough times and propel you further 
um, during great times. And, and it's important to, to know that, have, have your faith and, and keep going uh, because without that why, without that clear direction, it's, it's very easy to get distracted because first of all, there are a lot of shiny objects along the way. And at the same time, it's also very easy to get discouraged. But if you have that long-term mindset, right? Because real estate is a, as we, as I like to say in accounting and finance, right? It's a fixed asset. It's a long-term asset. So it requires a long-term mindset. Things are not going to happen overnight, but they will happen, right? And so as long as you, you know that and you have that persistence and do the work and, and keep going, don't give up, you will succeed. So I had to keep reminding myself that as I was going through some of those down days and, and days of uh, discouragement. Thank you so much for reminding us too, because you know some news indicators and uh, you know, people who are trying to make it into the business. Um, whenever we can, we don't see the silver lining. Whenever whenever we don't see a win, it's so easy to get discouraged and you know and just like tell ourselves this is not working. You, know, I, I think I did the, the I did a, I made a mistake. I did the wrong thing. But like you said, going back to the why, why are we doing this? It, it will always put us back in, in the correct path. So, so Vessi, how did you, I, I'm not sure if you already had done underwriting in, in commercial lending. I think you guys do that there, but how did you get started in, in underwriting real estate? So did you have to bust out a book or you had to take classes? How did you learn the steps? It's, I think for me, it is one of the hardest thing to master. Mm -hmm. I can talk to people, create relationship all day long. Give me an Excel spreadsheet. I blank out. I just, <laughs> so, and I, I, I'm, I self-proclaim this. I say, I am not the underwriter. I, I kind of know how to do it. I know how to, how to napkin underwrite at least, right? But it's one of the hardest things to master. So how did you teach yourself that? This is a great question. And, and yes, I could leverage a lot of my prior ex experience, but that was on the lender side. As an operator, you look at the deal from a different angle, not only from what is it today, but what is the potential of the deal going forward, right? How, how do I multiply the value? Um, so from that perspective, that was a new learning experience for me. And, and I am an avid learner. So I did a couple of things. One is, of course, uh, going through the uh, educational component of the mastermind that uh, you and I are both part of um, and really doing a deep dive on the lessons there. Secondly, there are a number of underwriting meetups and, and luckily at the time, things were a lot of things were still virtual. So, so joining those through Zoom, um, doing a deep dive on various educational resources like uh, Robert Beardsley's book uh, on underwriting and, and going through his motto. Um, so those are just to, to name a few, but really the most I learned is through practice and, and it's underwriting those deals and getting the reps in. And, and sometimes I would look at a deal and know, okay, it doesn't meet my criteria, but I would go underwrite it anyway. One, because I want to provide feedback to the broker on why the numbers are not penciling in. Two, I really wanted to build that muscle memory. And that's why it's important as you go through the process, there are a lot of underwriting models out there. Pick the one that feels best for you and be consistent because they are all slightly different. Um, they all won't have all the features that you want. They're not perfect, but as long as it's the best one for you and master that model so you're consistent, you become more efficient over time, you understand the inputs, the drivers, um, and again, practice makes perfect. So the most I learned is by actually doing the work, getting in the reps, building that, that muscle memory. And um, when it comes to underwriting, that's why, that's why it's important to also know your market um, because a lot of that determines the assumptions and, and inputs that you will apply into the model. And, and that's where the art part comes in, right? There is the science part, which are the fundamental principles that everyone follows, but there is also the art um, of, of the projections and, and rent growth, et cetera, that comes from experience, your knowledge of the market. 
as well as your risk tolerance. Um, so that's where you start seeing variances. Two people may underwrite the exact same deal and come to very different conclusions, right? Because their maybe their knowledge of the market is different, or their risk tolerance is different, or their outlook is different. So um, I'll pause for a second and, and happy to to dive deeper. Yes, um, interesting because this is the first time I've heard of Robert Beardsley. I don't know if the uh, some. Uh, some of the audience have used this model before, but I'm familiar with, you know, the, the usual Michael Blank um, mm -hmm. and also Rob's, uh, sorry, Rod Cleave's CR, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, not CRM, but his his model also. Model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. I've seen that. So, so are you exclusively using Robert Beardsley's model? Not exclusively. I've mostly been using Michael Blanc's. This is the one of the first ones I came across, and it actually comes with a full course, uh, online course on how to use the model and help with some of the drivers and, and assumptions. With that said, I what I like about Robert Beardsley's model is the fact that it has the sensitivity analysis built in. Um, so we've used it actually on, on my two syndications. We've used Robert's model um, for uh, for that analysis. So I would say I probably fluctuate between the two. I, I also like Rod's model. I use it in, fr from time to time, but when I started, um, his latest version was not available. So Michael Blanks and Rob, Rob's is what I focused on. Very good. I'll, I'll have to check out Robert Beersley. I do have the Michael Blank and that's what we, we mainly use. Mm -hmm. So. So you've underwritten um, and you continue to underwrite. So let's talk about underwriting in today's market. What has changed? So, or has anything changed at all when you were underwriting your properties back in 2022 versus your underwriting now? What are you taking into consideration? Are you, you know, more conservative than ever? And um, what are the factors that you, you, you remember and factor in into your models? Mm -hmm. Boy, a, a lot has changed in just uh, 12 short months. Uh, who, who knew? Uh, who knew that we'll be living in a different universe? Um, I would say when I underwrite deals, there are six, really six areas that I focus on. And I'll, I'll do a deeper dive on, on each one and how that has evolved versus a year or, or two years ago. Um, so I look at first and foremost, the sub-market. And then I look at the top line, which is the rent growth and assumptions, the expense side of the equation, number three. Number four would be the entry and exit cap rates. Number five would be the um, debt structure. And number six would be the operating reserves. So in terms of um, sub-markets, uh, there are a lot of things you can do to a property, but you cannot lift and shift it to a different location. So I definitely like to make sure they're in a safe neighborhood with nonviolent crimes, um, median household income above a certain level. I usually like it to be over $40,000, $45,000 a year because ultimately your, your clients, your, your residents, right? Um, are the ones who are paying rent. So you ultimately you want to make sure that um, that rent is affordable for that for that client base, looking at low poverty rate. When it comes to rent, a lot has changed over the last year, the 20 and in some markets, even 30% annual rent growth, um, which were not common to begin with, no longer exist. And so now we're returning to a more normalized historical rent growth level. And in some markets, even this year, we're experiencing rent declines. So <clears throat> as I evaluate deals, particularly for the first year, I tend to be a little more conservative, maybe projecting even no rent growth and then returning to a more normalized rent uh, growth level. Uh, vacancy assumptions go into that equation, the top line as well, especially as we're um, depending on who you speak to, maybe it's soft landing, maybe a recession, but it is not uncommon to see a higher vacancy um, during times like that. Well, so what do you put in your vacancy rate uh, in your underwriting today? Um, so it would, again, vary by market, right? So I also look at that information. What is the historical vacancy for that market? In some of the primary and secondary markets, it's probably lower, but in, sec on, in certain secondary and some tertiary markets, it will be close to 10%. Mm -hmm. So it's very market specific. I would say for my markets, the long-term vacancy has been um, physical vacancy has been around seven or eight percent. 
Um, so that's what I would resort to. And then economic vacancy, which effectively boils down to either non-paying units or units requiring concessions. That's anywhere from three to 5%. Uh, again, that's very market and sub-market specific, which is where having that knowledge really um, comes in handy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's on the top line. And then on the expense side, I look at um, taxes, making sure that's appropriately adjusted, right? In, in my market in Florida, that's assessed annually, but there are certain counties that assess every three to five years. So guess what? If your property was just reassessed, you have a three or five year runway um, to go through before you go through the next reassessment. So again, going back to knowing the market and having that local knowledge is how that ties into your underwriting and what assumptions you will make. Mm -hmm. um, insurance is a really hot topic right now with, for certain uh, locations, Florida being one of them. I think Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, other markets that are experiencing exponential growth. And in, in Florida in particular, regrettably, insurance is right now killing a lot of deals. Mm -hmm. And so when I started, it wasn't uncommon to see 500 a door uh, for insurance. Now it's at least 1,500 a door, and in some cases, even 3,000. So, uh, but why do I know it? Because again, I, I stay active in the market, talking to brokers, underwriting deals. Uh, and labor, right? Labor um, has increased exponentially. So making sure you factor that in uh, into your um, expense assumptions. Um, when it comes to number three, entry and exit cap rates, mm -hmm. uh, that's where, again, I resort to knowing your market because you <clears throat> want to ensure that uh, you, you know what your entry um, cap rate is and then um, expand it from there because even if the market improves, you don't know if that will happen. You don't want to rely on that for your deal numbers to work. So expanding the cap rated exit um, anywhere from 10 to 20 basis points a year, how, how aggressive you go would really depend again on the market, the property age um, and type, et cetera. Um, Reserves, I'm very particular about reserves. I like to have at least six months of operating expenses and debt service. And I've stayed consistent in that approach, which um, has worked really well for us and, and for the deals that I currently have in my portfolio, especially in the current environment. Um, almost always there are things that you don't expect. Almost always there are things that go wrong. You, if, if we could forecast the future, right, we'll probably be doing something different, but it's those reserves and that cushion that help carry you through tough times. And I, I saw that right as a lender in, in 08, 09 with a lot of the borrowers in my portfolio. Those who had cash and cash flow were uh, able to weather the recession. And when cash flow got compressed, those who had reserves or cushion were able to weather the storm. And last but not least, the debt terms. I uh, All my deals in, in single families, as well as now in multifamily, have been with fixed rate debt. Um, does it mean it's always right to have fixed rate debt? Not, not necessarily. I, I like to mitigate interest rate risk because I, again, I'm I'm, I don't have a crystal ball, so I don't know where rates will be a year, two, three, four, or five from now. That's why I personally choose to hedge. But if you have a property that's heavier lift and, and, and requires some rehab, maybe um, bridge may be more a suitable option. But there, there is also fixed rate bridge, so you could fix that in the short run. Uh, right now, a lot of operators are experiencing uh, challenges because those... Um, cap rates, which is one of the derivatives used to hedge interest rate risk, those costs have risen exponentially due to the volatility of the market and the now higher interest rate environment. And it used to cost a, a, you know, a few thousand, a couple hundred thousand, depending on, on deal size to, to buy such a, an option. But mm -hmm. uh, in the current market, that could cost you a million or more. Um, so imagine the, the hit um, that it has on on the operator, which is again where the reserves could come in handy and, and offset some of that unexpected fluctuation. So uh, I know I threw a lot, so hopefully that wasn't too overwhelming, but these are the six uh, six pointers um, that I look at the submarket, top line, expenses, exit and exit, uh, entry and exit cap rates, 
operating reserves, capex reserves, and then making sure the debt structure is aligned with the business plan. Well, yes, thank you so much. That was a lot of information for sure. And I'm glad that I'm recording this because I'm gonna go back and then listen to it again. But how does this apply? Let me talk to the passive investors in this call. Mm -hmm. How does this apply to you? Why is it important for you? Um, for you to know, you know, like I know that you guys are not in the active role. However, as passive inv investors, we need to know how uh, how the deal is underwritten. It's part of the due diligence. Mm -hmm. um, you, you need to be asking these questions. So when I was a passive investor or when we were looking at a deal as a passive investor, Tarek and I, we looked at underwriting and we, we looked at um, what is the cash flow? Where is the cash flow coming from? Is it a re, did the, did the operator, did the syndicator projected to increase the rent on year one? And just like Vessi had said, it may not happen. It, it, it may not actually be realistic to increase rent on year one, right? Um, are we increasing in year two? Maybe it's more possible. So these are the things that you, you wanna look at. And then also like um, what Vessi had mentioned, what type of debt structure is the deal? Um, does the deal have? You know, is it fixed rate? Is it is it a bridge loan? Um, why is that important? Because of obviously what's happening in the market right now. The interest rates have been rising, and we don't know. Um, in fact, in the conference yesterday, nobody can agree whether the the Fed is going to continue to in increase interest rate. So. So these are the things that you, you need to be looking at when you're putting in um, your money, when you're giving your money to, to a syndication or you're putting your money into a deal. And also expenses, just like, uh, you know, Vessi had mentioned, Florida, Texas. I didn't even know about Oklahoma and Louisiana that insurance rates have increased in those areas. I know for a fact, Florida and Texas has, has been incredibly high nowadays. Um, so see how are they projecting, what are they assuming that the, that the uh, insurance, did I say interest rates? Insurance, the insurance rates are. So um, these are the things that you would like to take a look before you, you give your money to somebody and it's okay to ask for their underwriting. In fact, some of the pitch decks that I've seen, a lot of them actually will have a sample of their underwriting on there. So. Um, now I know we have a few um, underwriters in the call, and I'm sure they have a lot of questions. So my question is, Vessi, did you, when you were learning to underwrite, did you underwrite and then did you have somebody check on your work or were you doing it in a group setting? What worked for you in order to learn? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is either bouncing um, ideas off of one another, either with other fellow warriors or joining some of those uh, Zoom calls to see how other people think through um, the assumption process. And again, that's a lot of it is different for everyone, but I do like to get a different perspective or, or a different set of eyes. And certainly for the deals that I ended up moving forward with, it was getting that second or even third opinion from other partners on the deal. Um, it's very difficult to do it in isolation, especially in the beginning, right, when, when you're learning. So I think it's helpful um, either to have a buddy where you guys are underwriting together or, or be part of some of those more flexible group where there are various people coming in and out and you can get different perspectives. Yeah. So let me pivot for a minute. Um, so you were learning underwriting, you were you and you were connecting with brokers, you were connecting with other warriors and other potential partners while you had a W2, while you while you're working in the commercial lending space. So you were a busy professional. Now, how were you able to kind of melt these two together? Walk us through that because a lot of us are busy professionals who don't even have time to sleep. <laughs> my friend Trevor will always ask me, when do you sleep, Rochelle? I was like, I, I don't, I don't know. I fall yeah. asleep. <laughs> and um, so how were you able to make the time uh, to do all these things? Yes. Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. Um, one is first of all, being very disciplined, right? I have a job that's very demanding but it was up to me to set the boundaries of, of how much I work. At one point, I used to work from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., right? Pretty long hours. 
Um, but when I made the decision to transition into real estate, I knew my endpoint would be five. So eight to five, I'll be there fully present, but after five, it's my time. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, so the reality is, especially right when you're working a full-time job, a lot of the real estate, I guess what some people call side hustle activities happen before and after your business hours. Uh, during lunch breaks or, or or breaks where you may have to take a call or answer an email. Um, so being very organized is something that really helps. Two is uh, one of my favorite books is The One Thing by Gary Keller. And yes, we all have very long to-do lists, but I like to plan my week ahead and my day ahead. And, and now what is the one thing that I must accomplish today? I may have 10, 10 things. What is the one thing, the needle mover that I need to focus on getting done today? And then two other, what I call secondary tasks, those would be great to do. And if I don't do it on that day, um, make sure it gets done on day two or day three, but staying extremely focused. And, and taking it one step at a time, because it, it can be very overwhelming. So, you know, there was a time I was underwriting right on now the deal flow has slowed down considerably. But at the time I was underwriting about a deal a day and they don't all come at a deal a day. Sometimes you go a few days without any and then you get 10 deals you have to underwrite you know, within the limited amount of time. So then you focus, OK, today I'm only going to focus on these two or three. And, and again, the more reps you you put in, the more efficient you become over time. So in the beginning, it would take me a long time to um, do a quick underwrite. And, and over time, that time period was compressed. Uh, but also, again, planning ahead and knowing I can get 10 done today, but I'll focus on these two or these three today and then three more tomorrow. And, and really taking in, in increments, baby steps and making sure I write down those goals for the day and the week and, and going after them. So um, so that's what really has been helpful for me is writing those goals, staying focused, staying organized, but also setting the boundaries, right, with my W2 and knowing, okay, after five, I might not be watching a Netflix movie, I may be underwriting a deal, but um, I'll have plenty of time to watch Netflix movies years from now <laughs> when I when I have more free time. I love it. I know there are so many good shows on Netflix right now. Um, it's very hard to stay away, um, but like you said, it's about being disciplined. And you had so so it's time blocking. It sounds like you you said from after five p.m. that is your time, you know. But by five p.m. you're underwriting, and then you plan your week. I love that. But one thing that you you had mentioned over and over is the word focus, and that resonated with me because I was introduced to a video last night by. Um, Jay Miller on one of the WhatsApp group. Mm -hmm. I hope, Jay, if you're watching this, this replay, thanks to you, but uh, he shared a video by Alex Hormozzi and I actually um, recommend for everybody to take a look at this video. Um, this guy had made, I think he's in the billion dollar mark now and he's only in his, I wanna say in his thirties. So he figured out, he said, you know like, why, he goes, you know why you're poor? Because you're not focused. You're doing too many things at the same time. You're looking at too many things. You're, you know, so, and just, just like what you said, Vessi, focus on, on one market and be good at it. And this is when it comes to your underwriting. That's how you know what to assume in your underwriting because you know the market. So I don't know Florida, but you do. You know Florida and you know that there are certain counties where the tax assessment happens every three to five years. So, be, and you knew that because you're focused in that market. and. I'm very guilty of this because I like, man, shiny things. What just let that the tiny little shine over there, I, I get distracted. So I really have to work on, on being focused. But thank you for pointing that out. Um, but that is one thing that I would like to share with everybody that I've learned today and last night too. So uh, focus on one thing and be good at it. Just just you know, drill down on one skill and and make sure that you know it, it inside and out. Somebody had set, asked a question on the chat. Um, let me see. Rashonda is asking, Vessi, do you or your company refi commercial real estate real estate loans? Sorry, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go back and forth now. If you have questions, go ahead and put it in the chat or raise your hand. So 
Uh, my employer does, my, my company does not, uh, but I'm here just for avoidance of doubt. I'm here representing myself and, and not my uh, W-2 employer. So, so you're the, her W-2, um, uh, the commercial lender. Sure. Yeah, the commercial, yes. Yeah, the bank, yes. I guess, what are, what are you seeing in terms of, yeah. um, in the commercial lending space, mm -hmm. what, um, what would you advise syndicators now? Like know, knowing what you know, what's happening in the space. Um, obviously you had said when, you, when we underwrite, we have to know, uh, we have to conservatively assume, you know, mm -hmm. the, debt, the, debt the debt structure, but what type of um, advice would you give those who are underwriting at this time? Yeah, so in the current environment, the principal approach that lenders apply is specifically when it comes to commercial real estate it's it's cash flow and it does is the property producing enough cash flow to service the debt so there are different ways they can size a loan a lot of people have probably heard about the loan to value ratio another approach is to base it on minimum debt service coverage and then there is a third based on uh, debt yield which is um, effectively your NOI um, divided by the loan amount or or the inverse measure of leverage. But ultimately what they would like to know to ensure, and they take the lesser of the three typically. Um, and so in the current environment, when cash flow is a little bit more compressed due to the rising costs of operating a property coupled with the higher interest rate, um, the uh, loan proceeds are also reducing. Why? Because cash flow is also reducing. So it's not uncommon to see lower loan to value ratios anywhere from 55 to 65 on, on more traditional um, commercial loans. So that's one thing to keep in mind as you're going into the deal that in, in the current market, uh, operators, owners are effectively required to bring in more equity as they're closing deals. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, a lot of lenders are now requiring um, that you fix the, the rate, which I, again, personally, I'm, a, I'm in favor of that. And I, I like that approach. Um, whether that's fixed rate debt or depending on who your loan provider is, applying some sort of uh, hedge instrument, whether that's a swap, color, uh, cap, um, that would effectively mitigate the interest rate risk exposure. So being able to plan for that in advance, fixed rates typically are a little higher right, than the floating rate debt. Um, but again, it um, also reduces the overall risk of the deal. And then um, one thing I also always like to remind people is to read your loan agreement and understand what your covenants are, because that's your that's your guidebook, that's your playbook that you're signing and agreeing to abide by over the term of the loan. Uh, what are your covenants? Um, typically, there's only one financial covenant for real estate loans in most cases, right? That's your debt service coverage. So understand how it is defined, because not all banks define it or measure it the same way and understand what other covenants you need to abide by, like reporting requirements, insurance requirements. Um, you most likely have limited ability uh, for other indebtedness. So bringing in shareholder loans or other loans. Um, these are things that can easily violate your credit agreement if you don't read it and understand it. And if, if you um, need support, it's always helpful to have your attorney review that because especially in the current environment, right? There are a lot of deals that unfortunately are suffering potentially going through capital calls. So there are a lot of providers that are thinking, yeah, I can sell my shares or yeah, I'll bring a loan partner. Well, not necessarily, because if you do that, you may be defaulting on your loan agreement. So make sure, or your operating agreement even. So make sure you understand those terms and provision, consult with your attorney before you take action, um, because it's, especially in the lending world, it's easier to when you communicate those things in advance, when you're upfront with your lender, where you're not hiding things, not asking for forgiveness, it's a lot easier to get those resolved ahead of time before an event occurs versus after, um, or, or trying to ask for forgiveness later, because that leaves a really bad taste in their mouth um, if you do things and 
and, and then um, try to, to fix things later. So making sure you understand those terms before you enter a deal. And, and some are some are actually negotiable. Not, not, all, not all of these covenants are set in stone. So there are certain carve outs that lenders may be willing to work with. Again, that's very lender specific. Um, so um, these are things that are important to understand before you head into a deal as you size the loan, figure out the proceeds, the rates and the terms and conditions. This is why I like to have guests who are way smarter than I am because I learned so much. <laughs> so, so basically, Vesi, you're saying, you know, we got to be transparent and we, we got to let our lender know what's happening. If it's, you know, if we're, we think that we're going to, we're, we're in a bad situation, um, if we think even the slightest that we might go into default, like let them know early on and that way because after all lenders they don't want us to default right so right. they want us they're they're going to help us out and um you know find ways on on how to to not have not that not happen absolutely i mean your lender after all is your biggest partner right if you think about <clears throat> the capital stack they contribute in the current environment it's anywhere from 55 to 65 percent of the capital Two years ago, it was 75 to 80. So, and, and lenders are not in the business of foreclosing on properties. They're in the business of making loans, taking, making calculated risk and, and getting paid back. Um, so it's not in, in, in their, they're not incentivized to foreclose. They're incentivized to work with you and, and figure out a solution together because again, ultimately they want to get to be paid back so um even though it's uncomfortable it's scary it's unpleasant sometimes to have these conversations you can probably arrive at a better solution versus trying to figure it out on, on your own yeah i agree um and there's always i don't know why but somehow i think we were just preconditioned to fear uh, our lenders right it's like oh my god i have to my, my mortgage due um, I'm not able to pay them. And somehow, why is it so hard to pick up the phone and talk to them, let them know? I think it's just, we're just preconditioned that way. But when in fact, it's like you said, we are, they are our biggest partner. And um, actually it wasn't until I came into multifamily real estate that I learned that, that I actually, um, I, I believe it was Broadway who had explained that if you go to your lender, they to you, they will actually try to figure out how to make a deal work, or even if you 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 show their your underwriting to the lender, they will tell you whether it works or not. Because mm -hmm. after all, like you said, they they're the ones who's gonna give you most of the money in order to make this to close the deal. Absolutely, yeah. Anytime, and I probably forgot to say that anytime you go through these assumptions, you want to make sure they're validated by a third party. Uh, whether that's your insurance broker for insurance, your lender for the lending terms, your property manager um, for the expected rents, rent comps, expense assumptions. So definitely getting that third party validation up front um, because you, uh, what was the saying? Measure measure twice, cut once. You definitely want to, to do that diligence up front before you, you get in the deal to mitigate that risk as much as possible. You, you can't eliminate risk, because the only way to eliminate risk is not to take one. And, and that's also not a great position to be in. Um, but when you understand the risks, then you can formulate an action plan on how to formulate, to mitigate those. Absolutely. Um, all right, we're almost at the top of the hour and I would like to open this, um, this webinar to questions. I'm sure you guys have some burning questions um, in terms of, uh, underwriting or just anything about real estate this is your chance to ask Vessi she she is obviously active in the marketplace so let us know put it in the chat or raise your hand um while we are while you're thinking of questions I would just like to do a shameless plug for our friends in massive capital they are doing a web uh, not a webinar I'm sorry it's a it's a virtual um, mastermind, I believe it is. Trevor, help me out here. It's from- Yeah, Boston it's just the massive uh, virtual conference. I put the link in the chat. I also put a code if you want to upgrade the VIP for half price. And uh, it's, it's this coming Friday and Saturday. And if you do do the VIP, you get the recording. So it, I know sometimes it's hard to go to all of them. Thank you, Trevor. So VIP investor, I think is the code if you would like it. 
and it's 50% off the VIP tickets because you also are VIP, we know that. So <laughs> um, hop on to ch check out the chat, the link is it's on there. And this is what, you know, Vesi and I are talking about do, connecting and networking with people who are smarter than you. I mean, the people who are gonna be in this event, um, everybody from Massive Capital and they also have guest speakers. So you don't wanna miss that. Um, actually, there was one question here that I think I missed. I apologize, May Lee. Her question was, oh, she was asking if we, we could write, I think she was, she was uh, referring to the factors that takes place in your underwriting that you had mentioned earlier. Oh, you mean to repeat them? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't understand. What was that question? Yeah, so the- To uh, repeat the six factors? Yes. Got it. Okay, so one is the sub-market. Sec number two is the top line. So looking at your rent, going in rent, rent growth assumptions, vacancy assumptions. Number three is expenses and adjusting those to the current environment, especially insurance, taxes, labor costs. Number four is reserves, operating reserves, CapEx reserves for any capital projects you intend to take on. Uh, number five is the entry and exit cap rate of the deal. And number six is the um, loan terms, the debt terms and how they align with the intended business plan. And um, you don't have to be very technical or a big underwriter, right, to go through those, but especially as a passive investor, as you're evaluating investment opportunities, uh, you want to um, at least have a conversation with the sponsor regarding those assumptions and, and make sure you you understand those as, as an investor putting in your hard-earned money in the deal. Uh, and secondly, that they can walk you through those assumptions. Thank you so much. Um, so what is what are you currently working on at the moment, Vesti? Are you looking at deals? Are you um, in the process of closing one? Yes, there is one I'm in the process of closing, but not uh, really allowed to talk about it in much more detail beyond that. It's a 506B structure. Um, I'm ultimately a net buyer, so constantly looking at deals as long as they meet my three criteria, one being the sponsor team, uh, two, the market, and the last thing I look at is the deal. Um, so I can speak to some of those if, if people are interested. Um, I, I don't do a lot of deals a year, do a couple of deals, but those are very carefully vetted and, and curated. Um, so definitely remaining active in the market and a net buyer, because I, I think there will be some amazing opportunities coming in um, in the next uh, few months. So staying active in the market. Yes, absolutely. Um, next question is, where can we find you, Vessi? How do we connect with you? Yes, the easiest way to connect with me is through my site, dbacapitalgroup.com. D is in dream, B is in believe, A is in achieve. I have a ton of um, free educational content there, as well as a copy of my complimentary digital book, The Busy Professionals Quick Guide to Investing in Multifamily which is really designed to make you guys more um, better educated and more empowered investors. I love it. So dbacapitalgroup.com. Yes. All right. So check and that she's out. She's been super famous. She's doing like more podcasts than I am. It's, it's like every day I open up my Facebook and there's Bessie on a podcast. You're killing it. Oh, thank you, Trevor, for your kind words. I'm I'm following in, in the footsteps of greatness like yours. <laughs> so so pleased. I'm so so excited for you. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I know Vesi has guested on on different podcasts. So if you if she, if you would like to have her guest on yours, reach out to her. But also, um, she had mentioned she has free content on her website. If you would like to check that out, I will definitely. I'm definitely. I'm there. Um, also, another question here, is there a specific website that you use when doing market research and for market rents, Vessi? Uh, there is a ton. Uh, first, for market rents, I'll, I'll start with that part of the question is, again, knowing your market, checking in with your property manager. Um, other public sites that you can check 
for, for guidance would be apartments.com, rentometer in, in terms of rents, uh, but really the best guidance will come from your property manager because they're, or, or your own knowledge having been in a certain market um, and, and knowing the comps. Um, boots on the ground knowledge as well. That's always number one and cannot replace any public source. For market research, there are a number of sites um, that I look at. Um, for crime level, spotcrime.com is one. But again, I always cross check that with my boots on the ground knowledge. Um, it's not always 100% accurate, which is why having that local trusted advisor is extremely helpful. And then for any market data, data the bls.gov, census.gov, census reporter, um, data USAIO, these are just a, a few of the sites to help you size up the median household income, population growth, job growth, job diversity. You can also subscribe to a lot of the online journals and newspapers for that market. Um, so then you can monitor any new um, job openings or major employment announcements or, or any other real estate related news uh, for that market. So these are just to name a, a few. Otherwise, I think I can provide a pretty long list. Don't want to uh, overwhelm the people. I would like to ask you this. I, I completely forgot to ask. What what are your markets? I know you're in Florida, and what other markets are you looking at? Um, so Florida, Georgia, and Tennessee. I've been mostly focused on those three because that's where I already have presence. And so within Florida, specifically Jacksonville, Orlando, and Tampa. Within Tennessee, I would say Memphis is where I'm currently at, although very interested in the Nashville MSA, Murfreesboro, Knoxville, Chattanooga. Those would be two markets that I'm uh, looking into currently. And then in, in Georgia, those would be Savannah, Augusta, um, just to name a couple. Very good. All right, you guys. If you have any more questions, now's the time. Um, but Vessi, are there any events where we will be seeing you at? Well, the massive capital event that you just announced, I'm really, really looking forward to it. Uh, I know the massive team puts up very high quality events. So I usually try not to miss those, whether they're webinars or conferences. So really excited about the conference uh, next week. Yes, the one uh, massive capital dot com uh, it's going to be august 11 and august 12 i believe it is so the the link is on the chat it's also on their website will you be at the warrior boot camp on september i will be uh not the boot camp in orlando but i will be at the warrior event in uh phoenix i think that's in november and for those in la and there is a multi-family the first ever what well, first from a few years because during COVID they'll stop, but there will be a multi-family conference uh, that Bronson Hill is organizing and it's here in LA, it's two days only. So I will be attending that as well. Okay, I would like to give information on that. I'd, I'd be interested, it's just a short flight away and it's a, it's a good excuse to go to LA. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. <laughs> All right, you guys. Well, thank you so much. It has been a pleasure chatting with Vessi. I learned so much and I hope you did too. Um, and I know you, if you have any more questions, please reach out to her, DBA Capital, sorry, dbacapitalgroup.com. And please check out her free content. Um, I know I will. So if you guys don't have any more questions, I will see you next Sunday. Our guest is another warrior, Miss Ify Aso. She will be my guest and, and it's gonna be fun. It's gonna be informational, it's gonna be educational. So I will see you then.